Evidence of rapid growth in the Treasure Valley is everywhere. More homes, condos, hotels, businesses, and tall buildings. More traffic, more jobs. Planning experts estimate the valley's population will grow from just about 700,000 now to more than a million in 2040. Leaders are planning for it and they want to hear from you. Today, Ada County Commissioner Diana Laciondo on the coordinated conversation they want to have with the community about the challenges and opportunities that come with growth. Plus, democracy in an age of anxiety. An upcoming conference at Boise State will tackle that topic. Tumultuous political times at home, tension and talks abroad. Boise State Chair of Public Affairs Stephen Feldstein on those issues and the focus of the conference featuring a former U.S. Ambassador to Russia. Ahead on Viewpoint. From Idaho's News Channel 7, this is Viewpoint. Welcome to Viewpoint. I'm Doug Petcash. Whether you like it or not, the Treasure Valley is growing very fast. According to the Community Planning Association of Southwest Idaho, Compass, the population of Ada County was just under 400,000 in 2010. By 2040, Compass estimates it will hit just about 700,000 in Ada County, over a million in the Treasure Valley. Now, growth comes with challenges and opportunities in housing, transportation, and employment. So, Ada County Commissioners want you to know what they're thinking, and they want to know what you're thinking about dealing with and taking advantage of growth. So, on Thursday, October 16th, the Ada County Commissioners are hosting what they're calling a coordinated growth conversation. It's from 5 to 7 p.m. at Expo. Idaho. They say it's an opportunity for you to learn and ask questions and to be a part of the policy making discussions. Well, joining me now to talk about all this is Ada County Commissioner Diana Lachiando. Commissioner, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. I appreciate your time. Um, so first of all, why is it being called a coordinated growth conversation? Well, there are many different jurisdictions in Ada County and really throughout the Treasure Valley who have some responsibility for planning, whether it's through our roads or through our schools uh, or through land use. And without coordination, we can't plan more effectively. So the Board of Ada County Commissioners has been on a road show over the last several months, meeting with all six cities in Ada County. We have our final meeting today with CUNA. And then we want to bring the community together to discover and talk through some of the things we've heard and where we might go in the future. How important is collaboration like that when you're looking at an issue that you know, takes planning so many years down the road? Well, it's just absolutely critical. Uh, we believe first and foremost that this is a special place. We have wide open spaces. We have a beautiful river that runs through many of our communities. Uh, we have a strong sense of community and this is a safe place. Um, and we want to preserve and protect that quality of life. But we also want to be fiscally responsible and how we grow mm -hmm. can dramatically impact our property tax dollars. And so it's critical for us to work together to ensure that we can protect that quality of life uh, while being fiscally responsible as we grow. What do you see as the biggest challenges associated with growth? It's, you know, growth really is sort of like aging. Uh, it's gonna happen, we know it's gonna happen but can we do it in a thoughtful way uh, while saving for the future? And uh, some kinds of growth are just more expensive than others. And that's really- Infrastructure. Infrastructure, and that's really what we hope to learn. So some of the folks who we're gonna bring, be bringing in to discuss options with the community have done this work around the country. They've seen some of the, the pitfalls, perhaps, that other communities have made things that we hope to avoid, and they're gonna help us potentially understand um, how can we grow in a thoughtful, responsible manner. Do you have some examples of those things that, that you're really watchful of? Yes, I think, um, and I think everybody's experienced it, even if they can't quite put their finger on it. Um, when we grow in a way that um, tends to maybe kind of leapfrog other developments, it can be more expensive for the community. So how do you put police protection, fire protection, getting paramedics out there, water, sewer, um, that is definitely more expensive to the taxpayers mm -hmm. um, than more coordinated, thoughtful, directed growth. So what do you see then, um, I, I think we, we tend to think about growth and we think about more traffic and congestion and density and things like that. There are opportunities that come with it, though. There is a flip side to growth. There's a positive stuff. What do you, how do you look at that and maybe you know channel that and, and right. also uh, you know help incubate that or right. nurture it? 
Well, I'd really put it in the context even of my own family, my own life. You know, I, I grew up here in the 80s, and there was a period of time where um, folks were leaving Idaho. There weren't really those job opportunities here, and that's not necessarily the case. We do have better paying jobs now. In fact, we have folks moving here to take advantage of those better paying jobs. But we need to ensure that Idahoans are educated to be able to take advantage of those higher wage jobs. So it's about attracting uh, those high quality companies who can support a family and really growing those businesses um, to be good stewards and community partners in our area. Um, so what is it that, that you want from the public um, in this process of this coordinated conversation? You know, there's been a number of efforts over um, really the past few decades to ask local governments to coordinate together. And some positive things have come out of that, um, but perhaps it hasn't reached the full fruition that it could have. It's hard, it's hard to work together. We, we want to retain our own control and jurisdictions. And I think we're really looking for the public to come alongside us to be a part of this process, uh, frankly, to hold us all accountable. Um, county taxpayers, or city taxpayers, our ACHD taxpayers, and, and vice versa. And we need the public to be a part of this conversation from the beginning uh, to help us stay in it um, so we can get this done. Are you talking about things you know, with the other cities you say you've been meeting with, and you know, CUNA being the final one? Um, is it about mass transit, um, rail? Um, housing it could be. density, it could all of be, that stuff? Yes, it could be down the road. The first piece that we're looking at is something called a fiscal impact analysis. And I know that sounds kind of wonky, um, but it's really understanding how our current comprehensive plans, how the cities have designated land use planning, how much is it going to cost? And that's a, a process that we'll all be undertaking over the next several months. And uh, it's gonna tell us something. Perhaps we have all the dollars we need to pay for that growth. Uh, but if we don't, then we're gonna have to ask ourselves some really hard questions. Is this the kind of growth that we want to see and can we afford it? And if not, what are our alternative choices? And, and to your point, um, if we can't afford to pay for uh, the roads, for example, into a certain area, do we wanna grow in that place or should we be investing in, in transit in another way? I'm not, I don't have a dog in that fight. I don't um, presuppose what's gonna come out of those conversations, um, but I do know we need accurate and thoughtful data to be able to have that kind of conversation. Now, I understand part of this um, information gathering process is that the people are gonna be able to take part in a real-time survey. Can you tell me about that and how that will work? Yes, so I'm sure you've been to meetings in the past where you've been asked to um, you know, utilize your cell phone to, to vote. So we're gonna be asking people kind of some, some probing questions about how they feel about their tax dollars being used, um, about uh, the different types of growth that they like or dislike. Um, so really trying to engage the public in that process. And this will be taking place during the during event the at event. Expo Idaho? Yes. Okay, um, obviously you're hoping for a large turnout. Are you expecting just a, you know, a wide, broad swath of, of of opinions and suggestions? Do you want people to say, I want you to do this? Or is it more, I think you it's all give of them the choices? Above. And, yeah. I think it's all of the above. We're just at the very beginning stages of this, so we want to hear everything. And I'll tell you, um, you know, I'm relatively new in, in political office, um, but when I was campaigning, um, concerns about growth were really across the county, and, and they varied from what was at the root of it. It, it, could, it could be traffic congestion in one neighborhood, in another neighborhood, maybe it was more about housing affordability, in another neighborhood it was about school overcrowding. We need to know what people are thinking about, we need to hear it, and that'll help inform these conversations going forward. And how can people get more information? They can go to our website, which is the Ada County website, mm -hmm to not only find out about this event, but to see uh, past meetings with all of the cities and to get some information about how they can stay connected going and, forward. And finally then, once you, you've had all these meetings with the cities, um, you're gonna hear from the public, uh, then what's the next step after that? Well, then we're gonna have some hard conversations potentially with the cities. Are we ready and willing to look at policy change? Uh, once we get these numbers back from the fiscal impact analysis, um, it's gonna tell us something. And, and that's really, I think, where we need the public to stay engaged. If, if they want us to look at policy changes, uh, we need them to be a part of that conversation. 
Commissioner Lachiandu, thank you so much for your time. It's definitely an important conversation. We hear about it all the time here from our viewers too, that growth is way up there at the top of their concerns and interests at times. So um, seeing how the county is addressing it and giving them a chance to weigh in, uh, it's a good way to go forward, I think, with this, and we'll keep following it. Great. And I do want to tell people again, uh, show that graphic for them. Again, this is an uh, event, the Coordinated Growth Conversation. Again, it's October 16th. That's a Thursday. It's uh, the Ada County Commissioners are hosting what they're calling a Coordinated Growth Conversation. It's from 5 to 7 p.m. at Expo Idaho. Again, Commissioner Laciano, thank you. Thank you. Well, still ahead on Viewpoint, the former U.S. ambassador to Russia in the Obama administration will be here soon for a big conference at Boise State. The theme of the conference is democracy in an age of anxiety. We'll look at the reasons organizers chose that theme. Pumpkin pie shakes are back at Arctic Circle. Create the best pumpkin shake by adding chocolate chips, cheesecake, or Oreos or try a famous above-the-rim Reese's Peanut Butter Cup Shake. Only at Arctic Circle, where the good stuff is. Find out if you have the winning numbers from your favorite Idaho Lottery draw games on Idaho's very own 24-7. It's Mega Fun Multiply. Mega Millions with Megaplier. Live drawings every Tuesday and Friday at 9 p.m. Then it's Powerball, where the jackpot is huge every Wednesday and Saturday at 8.59 p.m. Live drawings four nights a week from the Idaho Lottery and only on Idaho's very own 24-7. What is hope? Hope to me was just that he would get to come home. I had no idea how hard it would be once he got back. I wish she'd stop drinking so much. She thinks it's helping, but it's not. I act like I don't care if he comes to my games but I hope he does. I hoped he'd get help. He told me to stop asking. I didn't. Then one day he asked for a ride. Hope is knowing there are other families just like yours, that the veterans they love got help and recovered. Go to maketheconnection.net and turn hope into action. We all come together and stand together to serve our veterans. We invest in the latest technology. We take the time to train the next generation of doctors and nurses. We work together to make sure we heal their bodies and their minds. This is our mission. More than 300,000 of us working as one, together with families and loved ones. No matter where they live in this country, we'll be there. We stand strong, united. Stand with us in caring for our veterans. A traumatic accident. I can't remember what happened. Wednesday. That's strange. I confuse those meds. Could she cause a fatal mistake? Dr. Manning, stay away from this patient. They brought the daughter in for burn. Now she's in a coma. Chicago Med, new Wednesday on NBC. Welcome back to Viewpoint. I'm Doug Petcash. These are certainly dramatic, intriguing, and high-stakes times in national and world politics and government. An impeachment inquiry is underway against President Trump as lawmakers investigate whether he tried to pressure Ukraine to dig up dirt on rival Joe Biden. There's the lingering fallout of Russian interference in the 2018 election and the current trade war with China. In this climate, Boise State University's Frank Church Institute is getting ready to host its 36th annual conference on public affairs. The theme is democracy in an age of anxiety, Russian intrusion, Chinese confrontation, populist disruption. It's Monday, October 14th from 830 in the morning to 3 p.m. in the Boise State Student Union Building's Simplot Ballroom. That is free and open to the public. Then at 7 o'clock that night, former U.S. Ambassador to Russia Michael McFall will deliver the keynote speech in the Student Union Building's Jordan Ballroom. Now, first of all, as background, Frank Church served as a U.S. Senator from Idaho from 1957 to 1981. The Frank Church Institute was established at Boise State in 1982 to promote civic engagement and understanding of public policy with focus on foreign relations. The Institute is nonpartisan. It is housed in the School of Public Service at Boise State. My guest today is the Frank and Bethine Church Chair of Public Affairs at Boise State, Stephen Feldstein. He also served as U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in the Obama administration. Steve, as always, thanks for being here today. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, so more specifically, why did you choose democracy in an age of anxiety as the theme for this year's conference? Right. Well, thanks. Well, I, to us, it seemed like a natural topic, uh, given all the issues that we're looking at these days when it comes to what effect Russia may have in our upcoming elections uh, when it comes to a strategic confrontation with China and what their model of governance looks like compared to uh, democracies. And when it comes to the rise of populism, the continued strength of autocratic leaders in Europe and other places around the world, 
we felt all these different strands really pointed to something that was worth unpacking further for the community. Now, I will talk more about that in a minute, but um, as we uh, look at some pictures from last year's mm -hmm. conference, I want to ask just in general, you know, 36 years of these conferences, what is the, the hope that you have or what, what is the goal of these conferences? What do you hope comes out of them? Right. Well, it's a mixture of things. I think one certainly is we want to bring knowledge and, and insight to inform the community. Uh, we also want the community to weigh in, to be able to engage in dialogue with uh, interesting and important policymakers uh, that are sort of nationally known. Uh, and we want to make sure that we're also surfacing some of these big issues so people can think about them, they can grapple with them, uh, and help sort of inform how they, f how they understand where our politics uh, and where our foreign policy is headed. So why does Boise State think that it's important to have an institute like this to be able to, to discuss these issues and, and mm -hmm. get the public involved? Yeah, well, I think it really fits in well with, uh, in particular, with the School of Public Services mission, uh, which is to really bring together the intersection of knowledge, academia, and public policy. And so to my end, uh, especially with this conference, we're trying to have a finer edge on the foreign policy side of things, and I think that fits very well with kind of what the overall mandate is. Now, as, as I mentioned earlier, a uh, former U.S. ambassador to Russia during the Obama administration, Michael McFaul, is your keynote, mm -hmm. keynote speaker this year. So will he focus on, you know, Russia interference, Russian meddling in elections, or just the broader scope of foreign relations with Russia? I think more of the latter. I think he's going to talk about kind of the Russian model of governance, his experiences when he was an ambassador there, really sort of pushing and fighting for core democratic principles and the pushback he got from a very autocratic, uh, kleptocratic regime uh, led by Vladimir Putin and sort of what that means and how that relates to some of the issues we've seen, uh, particularly Russian disinformation and the undermining by them of various democracies around the world. Uh, was he in office there right up to the end of the Obama administration? Uh, he was not. Uh, he was there for part of the Obama administration. Well, it's going to be, you know, interesting to, to, to hear the, you know, the, the inside insight from somebody who spent obviously a lot of time in Moscow um, dealing with uh, the Russian counterparts and everything. And what do you think right now? We hear most about Russian interference in the election, of course, because of the Mueller report and everything. But from your perspective and perhaps his, if you've t talked to him, what is the biggest concern, the biggest issue right now with Russia? Right. Well, they're a wild card. I mean, they add a layer of volatility, no matter which way you look at it, uh, around the world, but, but particularly in liberal democracies in Europe and the United States. So we know that they are continuing to foment disinformation. Uh, they have an interest in sort of destabilizing elections and really sort of proving that their model, or at least the democratic model, is one that's weak. Uh, and so I think that should be of concern to all of us because by doing so, it really undermines faith uh, and the integrity of what we're trying to, to do when it comes to democracies around the world. And do you expect Russia to continue to meddle in the next election? At least according to our intelligence services and many other experts that uh, you, can, you can count on it. So we should be ready and I'm not so sure that we are, at least right now. Um, also, based on, you talk about democracy in an age of anxiety, we see a lot of tension just here at home mm -hmm. between President Trump and the Republicans and the Democrats. You've got the Mueller report, the investigations, impeachment inquiry now. Um, based on what uh, we know so far about this phone call with the uh, Ukrainian president, uh, Vladimir Zelensky, and whether or not the president you know, asked him to dig up dirt on political rival Joe Biden, do you think, in, with your experience and knowledge, that there is enough there that it is an impeachable offense? Oh boy, that's, uh, that's quite a question. Um, I think it's certainly, I, and I think that where things are going is, it's hard to know, we need to get the facts out, but there's certainly enough there for us to, for the Congress to push forward and make those inquiries. Do you think that the impeachment process itself is just so disruptive that the regular work of our political leaders can't get done? In my experience, uh, I worked in the State Department. I also worked in the Senate as a staffer for close to five years on the Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, when something as big as this happens, it takes over everything. So my concern would be both, uh, in particular when it comes to the State Department, it's hard for diplomats to do the day-to-day -day business, to get uh, sign-off on certain decisions, to move the ball forward on a host of different issues when this ends up consuming everything. Uh, so I do hope that it's something that will wrap up, uh, you know, uh, 
expeditiously. I think that's what the Speaker uh, Pelosi has, mm -hmm. has called for. Uh, but there's a lot of concern, and there are a lot of things there that are worth unpacking and inquiring further. Uh, and I think we're all watching it very closely. Two other quick points that you made uh, about the, uh, the conference that's mm -hmm. coming up. One of those was Chinese confrontation. Mm -hmm. How big of a deal is this trade war with China? Um, and do you think that the president's increasing of the tariffs is the right way to confront China with some of the business abuses that they've had, you know, with like cyber, you know, uh, mm -hmm. not terrorism, but uh, you know, they, the stealing of information right. from companies like Micron. Right. Um, you know, I, I think that with the tariffs and whatnot, I mean, I think it's a little bit, it's sort of conflating two different issues. I mean, there's an economic dimension to everything that's happening right now. I don't exactly know where that's going. I'm not sure there's a real game plan or strategic uh, sort of end uh, objective in sight. That worries me. Uh, if you were sort of to ask me where are things going to end up in three months or six months, I couldn't tell you because things seem to change mm -hmm. constantly. I think there's an al also another question when it comes to the strength of China and what they're trying to do in terms of promoting and working with different like-minded countries to push back against a liberal democratic system. Uh, that also is something that I think is worrisome and an aspect that we're going to look at in this conference. And then also uh, the last uh, subtitle on the conference is populist disruption. What do you mean by that? Right. Well, uh, we have a lot of leaders who are pushing nativist, nationalistic objectives uh, in order to further their own power. Uh, it's something that goes against the idea of pluralism. It's something that oftentimes pushes back against ideas like diversity. Uh, for example, you're seeing a lot of pushback by leaders in places like Hungary against the, the migration uh, waves that have come through. And what this tends to do is it tends to kind of close off different countries, and it tends to kind of go against the principles of the international system, uh, the ideas of an open, democratic system. You know, these populist tendencies really tend to kind of put a lot of questions to uh, where democracies are going. It sounds like it'd be, it's gonna be a fascinating conference. I wanna let people know again um, by showing on, on the screen the, uh, the details they need to know. Again, the theme is democracy in an age of anxiety, Russian intrusion, Chinese confrontation, populist disruption. Monday, October 14th from 8.30 to three in the Boise State Student Union Building Simplot Ballroom. That is free and open to the public. To, you can come and, and watch the panel. Then at seven o'clock that night, former US Ambassador to Russia, Michael McFall, will deliver the keynote speech in the Student Union Building's Jordan Ballroom. Is that also open to the public, or do people it is, need tickets it is, for that? It is. It's free and open to the public. We hope to see you all there. Both parts of it, then. That's the, right. The morning session and the evening speech as well. All right, well, Steve, I'd like you to stick around for just a little bit longer. We're going to wrap things up with Stephen Feldstein, and we're going to get his take on negotiating with North Korea after a break. It's window and door replacement made easy with Dream Style Windows and Doors featuring Pella. This month only, save 18% plus an additional $500 off your project with 12 months no money down, no payments, and no interest. At Dream Style, we'll handle everything from your initial consultation to finding the right finance plan for your project through our expert installation. We offer a wide range of exceptional quality Pella windows with different price options and features. We're here to find the the right window for your home. With Dream Style Windows and Doors, enjoy a stress-free solution and one point of contact for your entire project. This month only, save 18% plus an additional $500 off your project with 12 months no money down, no payments, and no interest. Hurry, this offer ends October 31st. Dream Style Windows and Doors featuring Pella. It's window and door replacement made easy. Call or visit dreamstylewindows.com to schedule your free consultation. Back by popular demand. When you shop Furniture Row, you pay what we pay. That's right. For a limited time, our employee pricing is available to everyone. Get 15% off a single item with purchases of $9.99 and up. That means you can save big on that perfect sofa, dining table, bed, or Denver mattress brand mattress. Our discount is your discount. Plus, no interest until January 2022. Furniture Row employee pricing. Available now for everyone.
And welcome back. I'm talking with Frank and Bethine, Church Chair of Public Affairs at Boise State, Stephen Feldstein, about foreign relations now. Well, Steve, it looks like the U.S. and North Korea are going to resume denuclearization talks. Uh, what do you expect to come out of that? Right. Not much. Uh, we've been sort of talking about talking, negotiating, having lots of pageantry over the last uh, year, two years, with very little to show for it. Uh, I think at this point we can, it's fairly clear what Kim Jong-un's strategy is, which is to continue prolonging and having the appearance of talking while maintaining uh, a nuclear capability. Uh, we haven't seen any progress at this point, and I think we have to ask some really hard questions about where this process is actually taking us and whether he's leading us on uh, into something that benefits him and doesn't benefit any U.S. goals. Now, supporters of the president say direct engagement with Kim Jong-un has, has led to some breakthroughs in terms of fewer weapons tests, fewer nuclear weapons tests, um, you know, and, and more progress than past administrations that isolated North Korea, you know, as it got the name Hermit Kingdom, you know, because of how isolated it was. Do you have a take on, on the, the, the different approaches uh, to dealing with him? Right. Well, first of all, I'd say maybe there's been fewer nuclear tests, but certainly not fewer ballistic tests and other types of tests. So that's one thing I would, I would point out. Okay. But second thing I would say, too, is that when it comes to confrontation or engagement, I don't think it's a either or kind of situation. You can do a little bit of both. So it's one thing to have talks. I think those, those are important. Negotiations are critical. But to give the kind of carrots that Trump has given, face-to-face -face meetings, meeting in a 38th parallel and so forth, without getting anything back in return, isn't good negotiating. It's not getting you any closer to the end goal, uh, which is to de uh, denuclearization. Uh, some people, his critics, you know, would say that he's being played. Um, do you see that argument as well? I think the situation tends to line up with that approach. I think uh, there's a lot of that going on. That's the big fear that, again, Kim Jong-un hasn't given up anything, and yet he's getting so much back in return. Uh, he's getting Just by some, being legitimized, you mean? Or? Right. You know, in terms of photo ops and legitimacy for someone who's really presiding over a brutal human rights violating regime, he's getting a ton of legitimacy on the stage. Uh, and, and that's not something he should get for doing absolutely nothing, which is essentially what he's done. All right. Steve Feldstein, thank you again, as always, for, for coming in. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Doug. And Appreciate your take it. as well. Yeah. Well, that is all of our time for this week's Viewpoint. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Doug Petcash. I'll see you tomorrow on today's morning news and then right back here next Sunday morning for another Viewpoint.